Salutations and welcome to Ralph Reads, brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4, the legal, the loyal, the regal, the royal, Ronin Ralph, your master of ceremonies. I would like to tell you kind folks to please tell a friend to tell a friend to like, share, comment, and subscribe to the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. Today on Ralph Reads, I bring the Al C. Clark, a.k.a. Donald Goins Crime Saga, Crime Partners, to its conclusion. So let's not waste any more time. Let the reading commence. Chapter 12 In the late afternoon, as Kenyatta and some of his group drove swiftly back towards town, Detective Benson and his partner sat in their office pondering the latest killing to be dropped on their laps. The other detectives in Homicide had just walked out from a briefing where the chief of police had read the riot act to them. Either make some arrests on some of the latest murders, or get ready to see certain changes made in the personnel. Some changes would be made, and none of them wanted to be the officers shifted around. It would look bad on the record, plus it would be a cut in pay. It seemed to me that bastard was looking right at me, Ryan said for the tenth time. I know. I had the same goddamn feeling, Benson admitted. It seems as if somebody is going to catch hell if something doesn't break around here. I had hoped that by now, Ben, some kind of break would have come our way. But there's been nothing. It's as if nobody knows a fucking thing about this. And I'm sure as hell that the same people are responsible for all these murders. Benson stared moodily at the ceiling. I'd have thought that after talking to what seemed like every goddamn junkie in the city, we would have turned up something. But no, not one damn break. Yeah, I know what you mean. We must have talked to over a hundred of the bastards, yet none of them, none of them could give us the information we really needed, Ryan stated, going over in his mind the long hours they had put in talking with various drug addicts. We can feel proud of the fact that we've helped Narco bust at least ten different pushers, Benson stated. Them guys in Narco have got it made, man. Just kicking a few doors down and they got all that they need to make their bosses happy. The sudden ringing of the phone made both men alert. Don't be in too much of a hurry, man. It might be another killing, Benson said. Yeah, yeah. I remember you, James Brown. I've been wondering when you'd call. I've been giving you a lot of thought, thinking you shitted us to get out that day, Ryan stated, leaning back in his chair. You're right around the corner, huh? Well, come on up. One of us will be waiting downstairs for you, Brown, so hurry up. Ryan hung the phone up and smiled over to his partner. And as for you, Detective Benson, he said, grinning at his partner, I don't ever want to hear you call these guys human riffraff anymore. Come on, I'll explain it to you on the way downstairs. I think our break has come. Ryan almost ran towards the elevator. Our boy Brown just might have something for us. He thinks he can pick out the mugshots of the men who put the finishing touches on our pusher man, little David. Yes, siree, he says he's sure of it. If the boys are in the mug books, we got our break. Did he see them do it? Benson asked as the elevator arrived. No, I don't think he's an eyewitness, or else he doesn't want to get that involved in it. But he says we should appreciate what he's got for us. Before Benson could say anything, he continued, Appreciate it enough to give him 20 bucks. Aw, oh, shit, Benson cried, not concealing the disappointment he felt. Before he could complain, Ryan leaped down his throat. Just what in the hell are you thinking about, Ben? Here you are crying about the only fucking break we've had. 
God damn it, man. I want to break this shit wide open too. But I don't expect the killers to come walking into our office and confess. Nor do I expect an eyewitness to come walking in. Now, here we've got a guy who says he can help us. And you're disgusted because the guy's not an eyewitness. The elevator stopped on the second floor and two uniformed policemen got on. The two men discontinued their conversation at the sight of the two detectives. Hey, Ryan, I'm sorry about that. You're 100% right, too. I don't know. It's this fucking steady flow of murders that's getting me down. Maybe I'm not thinking right. Or maybe I'm thinking too much about the case. How many officers have been knocked off in six months? How many arrests with convictions have we come up with? Benson didn't wait for an answer. He continued. But I do know you're right about what you just said. The elevator came to a halt on the ground floor. Ryan put his arm around Benz's shoulder. No, I'm not right. I'm wrong as hell for jumping on you like that, he said as they walked away from the staring officers. I should know better than anyone how a man can hope too much. I know exactly why you feel disappointed. It's because you're such a damn good cop. That's why... Before the men can continue their conversation, the man they were looking for came running up. James Brown glanced around nervously. I... I don't like to be seen down here. Come on then, Ryan said and led him back towards the elevator. Brown didn't say another word until they were on their way up in the elevator. Now, what's this crap about you're pretty sure these boys made the hit, even though you didn't see them do it? Ryan inquired as they reached the third floor and got out. It's, it's like this, man, Brown began. These two guys were watching little David for the past week. I mean, really laying on the guy's tail. That's the reason why I noticed them. They didn't show up until David did and didn't leave until after he did. At first, I thought they might be cops, you know. But after getting a good look at them, I knew they were hoods. Next, I put them down as a couple of stick-up men who were trying to figure out a way to knock off little David. When I say knock off, I don't mean put him on ice. I just figured they wanted to rip off some of the dope money David was racking up. Benson led them to the rear of a large office. There was a long counter in the front where two policewomen worked, but they went past the counter. He opened the door into a small room with nothing but a desk in it. There were four hard back chairs scattered about. Benson held the door open for the other two men to enter. Then he went back out. He returned, carrying three large books. I figured we'd start with the books that contain all our hold-up men, he stated as he dropped them on the desk. Damn, Ryan, you know these bastards are heavy, right? I don't know how those women handle them. I do, Ryan replied. They don't try to carry three of them at the same time. Both men laughed, then fell silent as Brown started turning the pages. I saw quite a few people in that one that I know, he said before opening the second one. He hesitated, then asked, If I find what I'm looking for, you guys are going to kick out the twenty dollars, aren't you? The two detectives glanced at each other before one of them made a reply. You know, we don't make it a habit of kicking out money. It has to come out of our own pockets, Brown. Brown shrugged and closed the book. His intentions were plain. Man, that's why I asked you about the 20 before I came up. I didn't want any misunderstanding. You wouldn't like to try out the ninth floor lockup, would you? Benson inquired harshly. His temper was at the boiling point. It wouldn't take much to make him slap the man in front of him. Brown shook his head. Nah, man, I don't want to get locked up. But that wouldn't help you bust this case open either. Okay, Brown, find a picture. Then we'll see what we can do about your 20, Ryan said, playing the part of the peacemaker. Reluctantly, Brown began to thumb through the muck shots again. He worked his way through the book slowly until he was almost finished with it. Then he saw what he wanted and stopped. 
Under the pictures were the nicknames Mutt and Jeff. Quickly, Brown glanced at the address. No known address. He quickly memorized all the information he could. This was what he had come for. This very information. Not for the funky $20 bill he was trying to milk out of the offices. The cheap bastards, he called them under his breath. Brown was shooting for way more than chump change. He had heard the wire on the streets. The information in front of him was worth far more than a punk-ass $20. Yes, siree, he told himself. The King Fisher would pay big stuff for this little bit of shit. He debated whether or not to tell the police anything, then decided it might be best to be honest with them. He might need a favor one day. These two cats here, he said and pointed his finger at them. I couldn't forget them two guys no kind of way. This one motherfucker looks as if he ought to be playing basketball with the motherfucking Harlem Globetrotters. Maybe even the Pistons. You know what I mean? This cat's really tall. Ryan glanced down at the pictures. A feeling of exhilaration ran through him. The only lead they had was from a woman who glanced out of a rear window and said she saw a real tall man going through her yard. It made sense. The pieces were beginning to fall into place. That's all Ryan had been waiting for. He had the feeling now that the thing would be busted wide open very soon. Benson began to put the books back together. I hope you ain't trying to shit us, boy, he said. But he too couldn't hide the excitement in himself. He too felt that it was just a matter of time now. They had the hitmen's names and pictures. Maybe they didn't have an eyewitness, but once they got their hands on these boys, they'd get a confession. One of them will crack. They always did. Well, Brown began slowly. You guys gonna keep your word? He asked, hinting about his twenty dollars. Ryan could see his partner's lips turn down in a sneer, and he knew that Benson was about to say something that they might regret later on. The informer had come through for them, so he might come through again in the future. It was well worth the price of twenty dollars to get a line on the hitmen. It's worth it, Benson, he said quickly. Brown here really earned his pay. Let's split it up. Who knows? He might come up with something else one day that we might be able to use. Benson didn't like the idea of paying out any money, but, as Ryan said, it was sure well worth it. Okay, give it to him. I'll give you my share as soon as we go out. I got to get some change for a 20. I don't know if I got that much on me, Ben, so why don't you give him your 20, and I'll straighten with you, okay? Gritting his teeth, Benson set the books back down. He fumbled around to get his wallet out, then removed a $20 bill. That was my fucking lunch money for the rest of the week, Ryan. I hate to see that bastard take it and shoot it up. I know Sally will give you a few more dollars if you should get up tight, Ryan said, referring to Benson's wife. Yeah, Benson replied, but he wasn't smiling. He didn't like the idea of paying informers. He tossed the $20 bill down on top of the desk. Don't have an overdose with it, Brown, he stated coldly. As he gathered up the large mug containers, Ryan watched his partner. The hunched over shoulders and the firmly tightened jaw muscles revealed the man's feelings more than any words could. Ryan decided to get rid of Brown as soon as possible. What's wrong with him? Brown asked as he was led from the room. You wouldn't think that I just gave him the information that might get him a promotion, would you? Brown was just paying lip service now. What he wanted most was to get as far away from the police station as he could. He would make his phone call from the nearest booth, then have King Fisher's men meet him somewhere. He wished there was some way he'd get to meet the King Fisher in person. That would really be something. He would be set for life then. Anytime you work for a man as big as the King Fisher, 
You had to handle big cash. How? 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 The thought kept flashing through his mind. If only he could set up an appointment, he felt sure he could sell himself to the man. Okay, Brown. Now you keep in touch, you hear? Ryan said as they reached the elevator. Don't worry about me, man. Just check your partner out. I hate to work for people that doesn't appreciate what I'm doing. I could get killed for this shit, whether or not you fucking guys realize it. I mean... Your buddy has his fucking mouth pushed out over 20 fucking dollars. Yet, I put my life on Front Street to help you guys out. I ain't getting no credit for this shit. I'm just doing you a favor, you know what I mean? Damn, Ryan said to himself, stepping back so that he wouldn't have the man talking directly in his face. Brown's breath stank like yesterday's turds. Another good smell of it, and he'd feel like letting up his lunch. When the elevator came, Ryan changed his mind about riding downstairs with the man. Okay, Brown, I'll let you go from here. You know your way out, don't you? Now next time, do it just like you did today. Don't worry about the money. If you have something nice we can use, I'll find the cash somewhere. Ryan held the door open and then stepped back before Brown could talk directly in his face. James Brown only nodded his head in agreement. Yeah, man, I'll just do that, he said, but his thoughts were completely different. It would be a cold day in hell before you bastards get some more information out of me, he reflected. If I hadn't needed to see that mug book, you motherfuckers wouldn't have gotten that info. He watched the door close, keeping the fake smile on his face until it was completely closed. Then he spit against the door. You bastards, he cursed loudly, since he was the only one in the elevator. As soon as it reached the ground, he rushed towards the nearest phone booth. How, oh how, he wished he could have gotten his hands on a snapshot of those two guys. Briefly, he wondered how he could go about getting one of the pictures. He knew the men were ex-cons. There had to be other pictures of the men around. His mind raced, trying to figure out how it could be done. If he went back upstairs after the detectives left, could he possibly con one of the other policewomen into letting him glance back through the books? Nah, the bitches wouldn't go for that. After all, they were police too, even though the cunts had pussies. Both of the phone booths were in use. He waited for a minute, then decided to find a booth outside. Brown almost ran out the door. He spotted one across the street, then almost got a ticket for jaywalking. He searched in his pockets frantically for the number. King Fisher's men had been up on the corner, passing out the number, telling everyone that the reward would be paid instantly. Finally, Brown found what he was looking for. Then he had trouble finding a dime. For a second, he thought he might have to go back across the street and get change for the $20 bill. He finally found a dime, dropped the coin in the box, and dialed the number. Just as quickly, he got a busy tone. He tried it again, and on the second try, got through. Hey, man, this is Brown. Brown off of John R. Street. Yeah. Well, I'm calling about that reward King Fisher is offering. Yeah, man. I'd like to see the King Fisher. Yeah, brother. I guess you would like to see the King Fisher. The man's voice came back over the phone. You and half the niggas in the city. Now tell me, man. What have you got? Hey, baby. Brown cried. It don't go like that. I'm calling about the reward money, man. So take this off. Whoever you got to get in touch with, ask them how much they will pay for the names of the two men that made the hit. The man on the other end of the line got serious. Sam had leaned on him and the rest of the boys. They wanted this shit cleared up, and this might be the break they were looking for. Listen, Brown. Give me that number, and I'll get right back to you. Okay, brother. Three, six, six... Hey, two, four, seven. But listen, my man, 
find out how much they're paying for the names you hear. I can't give you the guy's addresses, but I sure can tell you where they hang out at. Okay, Brown, just hold on, man. The line went dead in his ear, and in three minutes, the phone rang. Brown here, he said into the receiver. Listen, Brown, I'm going to send a car to pick you up. Where you at? Brown hesitated for a minute. How do you expect to pick up your money, man, if we don't do business with each other in person? The voice asked. Okay, my man, Brown answered quickly. How about picking me up on the corner of Brush and Verner Highway? How long would it take? We're leaving now, man. We'll be in the black Cadillac, so when you see it cruise up, you'll know it's us. Oh yeah, Brown, don't let this be no bullshit, man. Cause we ain't got no fucking time for games. Don't worry about it. The phone went dead in Brown's ear. He hung it up and started walking. He figured that by the time he got there, they should be pulling up. He was right. He hadn't been on the corner five minutes when a black Cadillac came up and stopped. Brown glanced at the two men sitting in the car as he walked up. Well, he told himself, here goes everything or nothing. They shouldn't do anything to me, he reasoned since I got the information they want. Maybe I'll really get a chance to see the Kingfisher after all. As he neared the car, the door opened. The man on the passenger side got out and got him back. You brown? The man asked as he came up. He could only nod his head in agreement. Get in. It was more like an order than anything else. The car pulled away from the curb before he could get the door closed tight. What's the guy's names? The question came harshly. How much cash is involved, man? Brown countered. I done told you once, Brown, that we don't play fucking games. Now, who were the motherfuckers who knocked off David? The feel of cold blue steel against his neck started Brown to sweating. Brown, we're not fucking joking with you, man. We want those motherfucking names. The gun pressed against his neck scared him, but the thought of the large reward being taken from him gave him courage. Hey, man, I heard the King Fisher was a for real dude. The word is out that he's paying a reward for this information, man, and I want my share of it. Now, if you guys are trying to shake me down, I'm sorry. Killing me ain't gonna get the information for you. Brown couldn't have told himself where he got the nerve from, but it was there. I want to see some green, man. Real paper. You dig where I'm coming from? The cats I'm about to tell on would bury my ass if they knew I was there, man. Tim was just a leg man. Sam had told him to try to shake the information out of the man, but to not blow it. Sam was on his way over to meet them so that he could handle it himself. He had the cash with him. The driver, Big John, did not say anything. Brown glanced out of the window. He was surprised to see them crossing the Belle Isle Bridge. They continued on around the island until Big John parked near the beach. As soon as they arrived, Another Cadillac pulled in behind them. A big man wearing an expensive suit got out of the passenger side and walked down toward a park table near the water. Tom motioned for Brown to get out and walk. Then he came out behind Brown. He led the way over to the tall brown-skinned man. Hi, Sam. This here's Brown. He says he's got the info we want. Sam spread his hanky and sat on the edge of the table. You wouldn't really be trying to run no game on us, would you, boy? He asked harshly as he studied Brown. You use, don't you? The question took Brown by surprise. Yeah, man, but I ain't sick and I ain't broke. I got enough for a fix, man, so this ain't no game. Let's see your bread, Sam ordered. Brown removed the $20 bill, plus seven more that he already had. He thanked his lucky stars that he had shaken the police down for those twenty dollars. It ain't much, Sam stated as he examined Brown closely. I don't know, boy. You just might be silly enough to try a shakedown. 
No way, man. My ma ain't had no fools. Can't you see, brother? I ain't no kid. Man, I've been around a long time, so I must have some kind of brain, Brown managed to say. What's the name of these punks that made the hit? Sam asked sharply. There were tears of desperation in Brown's eyes, but he shook his head. Man, the wire said the big man was paying a reward. Now, I don't have to get all of it, but I ain't giving up what I know for nothing, you know what I mean? I just ain't gonna do it. Them cats will fucking kill me if they know I was here, so I want to see some kind of bread. Sam examined him closely. He was pretty good at reading human nature, but he also knew a junkie could lie to Jesus and get away with it. How do I know these guys you're talking about did it? Sam asked, then added, How the fuck do you know if they really did it unless you was up on the hit? Brown choked back a lump in his throat, then said, I'm going to tell you what I know, then see if you believe the names are worth anything. Then he ran it down how he had watched him following David for the past week. When he finished, he told everything except the names. And you say you know these motherfuckers' names, huh? For the first time, Brown told a lie. I was in a joint with him. They don't know me, but I sure know them. There's one guy I played on the prison basketball team, Brown said easily. Sam shook his head. It sounded like these were his people, all right? He believed that he would have been able to see through the lies if Brown hadn't been telling the truth. Yet he didn't know where they lived, which made sense too. Hitmen wouldn't run around telling people how to get in touch with them. But Brown knew what neighborhood they hung out in. All young blacks have to have somewhere to hang out and brag. Tell me something, Brown. Do you think your information is worth five grand? Sam asked. Brown shook his head. It might not be worth that kind of money, but it's worth something, mister. Sam pulled out his roll and peeled off two $100 bills. How about that? He inquired in that cold voice of his. That should just about pay for the neighborhood they hang out in, Brown replied, seeing the huge roll and realizing that it was up to him to talk his way into as much money as he could get. I not only know the two men's names, I also know their nicknames, Brown stated, wetting his lips. They had become so dry that he found it hard to talk. So I'll ask you in all honesty, don't you think that's worth more than what you're offering me? Sam looked at the man and laughed. If you weren't a hype, Brown, I could have used you. Now, give me some information that I can use. He wasn't asking anymore. Brown didn't bother reaching for the money. I'm going to put all my cards on the table with you, man, and hope you'll give me a fair shake. I don't know how much it's worth to you. Only you can be the judge of that. How much it's worth to me, Sam thought to himself. It's worth my home, my car, my wife, my very life. That's what it's worth. But he never showed it as he talked. King Fisher wanted the men who had done this. And if he didn't get them, he was going to replace a lot of people. Starting with Sam. Sam made a gesture with his hand. Let's hear it, Brown. I ain't gonna try and fuck you out of no money. If I think your information is good, I'll pay you accordingly. Okay, Brown said. The short one's name is Billy Good, and the tall one is Jackie Walker, I think. But anyway, they're called Mutt and Jeff, because one's so tall while the other one is so short. They hang out on the north end. Sam stood up so quickly that he took Brown by surprise. Get on the phone, he said to one of his men, and call Benny's Barbershop. Ask him for the lowdown on a couple of punks called Mutt and Jeff. Then ask him what their names are. The man hurried over to the car Sam had got out of and started talking on the phone. He was back in a few minutes, smiling. The two studs are supposed to be pretty good stick-up men, and there are a few wires out on them as hitmen, even though their business is generally kept quiet. Dangerous is the word, Benny said. What about their names? Sam asked, snapping his fingers. Did you forget to ask? Nah, I got them, Sam. 
Um, let me think a second. Oh yeah, Billy and Jackie. He didn't know their last names, but those are sure the first ones. Sam smiled broadly, but the smile didn't reach his eyes. He was sure they had their men. It was just a matter of time now. Go back and tell Benny to get a line on where the two of them stayed, he ordered, and waited until the man left. I guess you did earn a little more than two hundred dollars, Brown, he said, and began counting. When he reached five hundred, he stopped. Brown couldn't believe his luck. At first, it had just been an idea, but it had paid off. Five hundred. He had never expected the five grand. The five hundred was like five grand. But as he watched, Sam peeled off some more bills. He put ten one hundred dollar bills in Brown's hand. How's that, Brown? Does that make you happy? Brown could only shake his head. Happy wasn't the word. He didn't know how to thank Sam. Sam just waved him down, not wanting to hear it. That's all right, brother, Sam said as he got up from the table. I am very thankful for the information you just gave us. If you want, my boys will drop you off at the nearest bus stop. And don't shoot too much dope at once, Brown. You might not live to enjoy your good luck. His laughter rang out loud and clear as he headed for his Cadillac. Chapter 13 Billy and Jackie ended up staying out at the farm until the day before the robbery. Then they decided to come back to the city. Billy had made one trip in earlier that week to take Joy over to her mother's house, where he had met her parents and played with her young child. The little boy was only four years old, but he had taken to the big man right off. The people on the farm who weren't working that day gathered in the driveway and waved goodbye to the group as they left. Billy was taking Joy back to his place. They had decided to try living together. After the holdup, Billy planned on taking a trip to New York. They had an uneventful trip back to the city. In a way, I hate to come back here. Billy stated as he pulled up and parked in front of their apartment. Yeah, I know what you mean, Jackie replied as he waited impatiently for Joy to get out. His long legs were cramped from the small space in the rear of the car. After this, Billy, we're going to have to start renting larger cars. Having never been over to the apartment, Joy didn't know which way to go, so she just stood on the sidewalk and waited for Billy to come around the car. She noticed the three black men get out of the parked car and start towards them. But she didn't really pay any attention to them until they were on top of the small crowd gathering on the sidewalk. Her first warning came when she heard Jackie call out, Look out, Billy! They got guts! At the sound of his yell, she glanced up in time to see what looked like a short stick come from under one of the men's suit coats. Then... The street lit up with noise. Billy brought a pistol from under his coat, but it was too late. He let out a cry of pain when he saw Joy fall to the sidewalk, blood running from a large hole in her neck. She never even managed to scream. Then he was lifted off his feet and hurled backwards. He heard Jackie scream, The bastard's using a sort of shotgun! From his knees, Billy tried to raise the pistol in his hand, but another blow struck him, spinning him around. The sidewalk came up and met him, even as Jackie started to crumble. He had been a little more lucky. He managed to get off two shots before the shotgun blew the life out of him. Carol screamed and started to run. A blow in her back knocked her off her feet. She crawled a few more feet on the sidewalk, leaving a bloody trail until another well-placed bullet took her out of her misery. She fell over on the sidewalk, face down. The people glancing out of their windows saw a rare sight even for a ghetto. Two black men and two black women dead on the sidewalk. Even as they watched, a black Cadillac with three men in it all the way from the curb, their job had been well done. The big man 
could sleep nights again. Maybe. We have reached the finality of this Alcy Clark, also known as Donald Goins miniseries on Ralph Reed's. I would like, or rather love, to thank my queens and kings, fellow royalty, for stopping by. You may reach me on Facebook, Ralph Anthony Garcia, on Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at RGMC2407. Email me, rgmc2407 at gmail.com, where if you would like to leave a donation, you may use the Zelle app or PayPal via paypal.me forward slash rgmc2407 and the cash app. My cash tag is rgmc2407. You may also find me on my other channel, RGMC, Ralph Garcia, Master of Ceremonies, and of course right here on TURN. The United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. Fellow royalty, pick up a good book, read a good story, and set your good self free. I appreciate you, and I love you like cooked food. I will see you folks on the next edition of Ralph Reads. Be safe. <laughs>